Welcome back, everyone. Well, today is July 18th, 2023, and that means that 160 years ago today was the Second Battle of Fort Wagner. It's the one that's made famous in the film Glory, the attack that was led by the Black Regiment, the 54th Massachusetts. It's the attack in which Colonel Robert Gould Shaw is killed, along with about half of his regiment, which are killed, wounded, or missing in the battle. So what I want to do today is take a look at a clip from the film Glory and then talk a little bit about what actually happened in this battle, what the film gets right, what it doesn't really show, uh, and kind of just talk our way through what happened on that day on July 18th, 1863. So this is a clip showing uh, Colonel Strong uh, explaining the attack. Colonel Strong is the commander of the brigade that the 54th is attached to for this attack. Uh, he was actually mortally wounded in this attack. So he's going to explain what's happening, show the fort, talk through it a little bit, and then we'll use that as our springboard to talk about the battle. We'll look at some maps, look at what the area looks like today. No one will ever take Charleston without first silencing the forts which protect its harbor. And the first one that must be taken is that. Now, one thing I want to mention right off the bat before we even get into this is that the movie gets this backwards. Uh, the the fort actually would have been on the left with the uh, from where the Union's looking. The fort's on the left, the ocean's on the right. So this should be kind of mirror imaged in order to get it properly. And I'll show you the map. Right amount of 10 inch Columbia, three smooth bore 32 pounders. A 42-pound carronade, a 10-inch coast mortar, and four 12-pound howitzers, plus a garrison of about a thousand men. Now, as many of you gentlemen may be aware, for the last four days, our Navy has weakened Wagner with a constant barrage. The headquarters has determined a time for our attack. We will proceed with a direct frontal assault tomorrow at dusk. Problem, gentlemen. The approach. The ocean and the marsh leave only a narrow strip of sand, a natural defile through which we can only send one regiment True. at a time. Now our best hope is that that leading regiment can keep the Rebs occupied long enough for reinforcements to exploit the breach. And I want to just point out that Matthew Broderick in this film, this is pretty close to the time when he does Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right? Uh, and a lot of people thought, well, was he right for the part? But he looks just like Shaw. Shaw was 26 years old during this battle. Uh, I did a video uh, telling his story, and I'll put a link in the description, and then at the end of the video, you can check that out. Uh, when I was at the Antietam battlefield last fall, the, the movie Glory opens with a scene of Shaw fighting at Antietam. He was a company commander in the second Massachusetts at the time they attacked through the cornfield. Uh, so I did a video telling his story. He enlisted as a private in a New York regiment in 1861, ends up commissioned in the 2nd Massachusetts, then gets bumped all the way up from being a captain in command of a company to a colonel in command of the 54th Massachusetts. But he fit Shaw's the role of Shaw perfectly. I thought he was f exactly the right man for this role, and he looks just like him too. Needless to say... Casualties in the leading regiment may be extreme. General Strong, the 54th Massachusetts, requests the honor of leading the attack on Fort Wagner. And can I just say here that Broderick in this scene, to me, has the perfect kind of balance of I'm scared to death but I'm also going to put myself forward for this command because I know how important this is to show that these men can fight. Like, he's got that fear, but also bravery all wrapped in one. It's Colonel Shaw, isn't it? Yes, sir. You and your men haven't slept for two days. That's right, sir. Do you think they have the strength to lead this charge? There's more to fighting than rest, sir. There's character. There's strength of heart. 
You should have seen us in action two days ago. We were a sight to see. I, I, I've, I've very rarely seen acting performances like this that so perfectly capture what I feel like the guy would have been feeling. Like I said a minute ago, you can see he's scared to death and also trying to be brave at the exact same time. I don't know if this particular scene really took place in real life. I don't know if he volunteered them for this or if they were given that option or how it all went down, but they did lead this attack. Uh, and so I want to take a look at some maps and talk a little bit about what actually happened here. So first of all, let's look at uh, a map today of Charleston Harbor, and you can see the harbor here. Uh, and so the entrance to the harbor is guarded by a number of forts. You've got Fort Wagner over here on Morris Island. Uh, there was also a battery, I think Battery Greg, up here at the tip, which is something they were trying to get to as well. They needed to silence Wagner and Greg there. Fort Moultrie is over here, and then you have Fort Sumter, which is, yes, the Fort Sumter that was uh, fired on to begin the war, uh, which was actually built on a man-made island here. Uh, this is not a natural island here. It was built by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, a man-made island. They build the fort on there, uh, and in order to get Sumter silenced, they first need to deal with these other forts that are uh, at the opening of the harbor and they want to be able to do all that so they can get their ships in to actually take Charleston itself. So um, let's take a look. Here's the American Battlefield Trust uh, showing. Uh, so this was all obviously land at the time. Erosion has, has taken away a lot of the land that existed in 1863 for this attack. Uh, but you can see there the, uh, the Confederate defenses, their uh, artillery that they've got facing south and so you can see here what I was saying how the fort's actually on the left and the area that they have to attack up the shoreline here uh, in 1863 shows how they can only get one regiment at a time and it's Colonel Strong's um, actually I think he, he may have been a Brigadier General by this point it's Strong uh, leading the attack and then Putnam after that Strong is mortally wounded in the attack. Putnam is killed in the attack. So both brigade commanders are taken out. Uh, here's another map that shows you what they're dealing with here. So Shaw uh, leads the 54th Massachusetts. They go first in this attack, followed by a number of white regiments, the 6th Connecticut, 48th New York, 3rd New Hampshire, 76th Pennsylvania, 9th Massachusetts, and then Putnam's brigade after that with four more regiments, including two from Ohio. Uh, and then there's actually a third brigade in reserve that is not committed to the attack. Obviously, in the movie Glory, we really only see the 54th Massachusetts. They make reference at the end to the supporting white brigades also suffering heavily. Um, so let's read a little bit about what happened. And I should mention, too, that the 54th Massachusetts, number one, was not the first black regiment in the Union Army. Uh, it was the first black regiment that was authorized by Congress to be raised as a federal regiment. There was, this, the, there was a Kansas colored unit. There were Louisiana units. But these were all units that were kind of way out in the West uh, that were formed from men, uh, a lot of whom were considered contraband, which was uh, a federal army term for freed slaves that were brought into the army and basically hired to do manual labor and things like that. And some of them were formed into regiments. Uh, they weren't really combat soldiers, though, though like the Kansas Colored Unit did see combat and some of these others did. The 54th Massachusetts is the first regiment that is authorized by Congress to be raised as an infantry regiment to be sent into the field as a federal regiment. And uh, there was also the 55th Massachusetts. And uh, the 54th, though it's a Massachusetts regiment, it's really a national regiment. There were men from all over the North who enlisted. They, they heard about it. They came. They enlisted. Frederick Douglass's son, Lewis, is in this regiment. Uh, there were dozens of men from here in Northeast Ohio. In fact, there's one buried down in Salem, which is about 20 minutes from me. Um, who was a, a veteran of the 54th Massachusetts. Uh, so this was really a national story, and people were very interested to find out how these guys were going to fight. And they fought well. You can see here the marsh that he's talking about. At high tide, that 
is all covered and so it really only gives that little narrow area there the 54th veers to the left to the center of the fort you've got the 6th connecticut and the 48th new york going up the middle the 62nd and 67th ohio from putnam's uh, regiment and or brigade end up hitting the right side but they're not able to break the fort um, so let's read a little bit uh, about what happens uh, so it says, um, the 54th received the honor of leading the charge. We don't know, uh, at least I've never read whether or not he requested that honor. Uh, but they knew they were going to face heavy casualties uh, in leading that charge. Their very first combat was two days before that. Uh, in the one that we see, uh, the, the battle we see portrayed in the film Glory. They had only had combat experience for two days at this point. Uh, so I want to read a little bit about what was said here. Uh, a correspondent writing for the Salem Register writes, The men moved steadily amid a buzz and whirl of shell and solid shot until within some 300 yards of the fort. We could notice the ominous silence that preceded the storm. For a moment, Wagner, Sumter, and Johnson were silent. Then bang, zip, zip, thud, crack, went the most terrific discharges of musketry, grape, canister solid shot and every description of ammunition into our ranks over our ranks and through our ranks it says unable to move to fire back effectively the 54th resolved to take the fort with bayonets under heavy fire they scaled the parapet and forced the battle to shift to hand-to-hand -hand combat and so it was during that time that we see a scene that's kind of a fictionalized version. The character of Trip, who is played by Denzel Washington, who received an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for his role as Trip, who's a fictional character. He grabs, after he sees Shaw mortally wounded, jump, Shaw climbs up and he turns around and he says, Come on, 54th! And he's shot and killed, uh, which did happen very early in the fight going up the parapet. Trip grabs the flag and turns around and says, come on, before he is mortally wounded. Well, in actuality, it was actually a man uh, named uh, William Carney who grabbed the flag and was repeatedly shot but survived the battle. And many years later, he will be awarded the Medal of Honor for grabbing the flag, going up to the top of the parapet, and encouraging the men to climb up and over and into the fort. Uh, he, he was not the first black man to receive the Medal of Honor, but his action was the earliest for which a black soldier was awarded the Medal of Honor because it took a number of years. I think it was in the 1890s before he's awarded the Medal of Honor. So his was the first action for which a black man was awarded the Medal of Honor. It just, there were other men who received it first. Um, so Lewis Douglas wrote about it, and he said, Saturday night we made the most desperate charge of the war on Fort Wagner, losing and killed, wounded, and missing in the assault 300 of our men. The splendid 54th is cut to pieces. If I have another opportunity tonight, I will write more fully. Goodbye to all. If I die tonight, I will not die a coward. So it says here, there was never a counterattack. The 54th being in the lead, a lot of their men were left up there in the fort. And men from the uh, two companies of the 97th Pennsylvania went up and rescued as many of the wounded as they could. Special orders were given to save as many members of the 54th as possible. Why is that? Well, you see that in the movie Glory. There's an announcement made that the Confederate Congress announces that any member of the 50, any, any black a man caught bearing arms against the Confederacy would be captured and sent back to slavery. Any black man caught in federal uniform would be executed. Uh, and men, any white officer who was captured uh, leading black troops would also be put to death. And so they knew, and we see examples of this, places uh, like Fort Pillow, where black soldiers are executed on site. It happened as well during the, uh, there was a, a raid on a place called Saltville, Virginia, in southwest Virginia, uh, and there were black soldiers who were being cared for in a hospital there who were taken out of the hospital and, and murdered uh, by Confederate troops. And one of the officers in charge of the men who committed that massacre was the only uh, Confederate soldier who was executed for war crimes during the war. 
Henry Vertz, who was the commandant of Andersonville Prison, was also executed. Um, but uh, this officer was the only one executed for crimes like that, actively killing black troops. Uh, so they knew that these men, if they were captured, could be executed or sent back into slavery. And so special attention was given to trying to rescue men of the 54th who had been wounded and lay in front of that. Um, so General Strong, uh, George Strong, a participant in the attack on Fort Wagner, said in all these severe tests, which would have tried even veteran troops, they fully met my expectations. For many were killed, wounded, or captured on the walls of the fort. Uh, even the soldiers defending the fort noted that the portion of the assault led by the 54th caused the most destruction. A Confederate officer wrote, The greater part of our loss was sustained at the beginning of the assault and in front of the curtain. Uh, so they were not able to take the fort, uh, at least not that day. Um, the men who were killed were buried in a mass trench, including Colonel Shaw, who was buried with his men. The trench where most of those men were buried has actually been washed out to sea at this point, unfortunately, so the bodies could not even be recovered at this point, uh, which is really unfortunate because it would be wonderful if they were able uh, to do that. Uh, eventually, the Confederates, it is said, I've read that in part, one of the reasons why the Confederates had to be evacuated on September 6th back to Fort Gregg and then eventually off the island completely was that the, their water supply was contaminated by the dead of the 54th and the others. I don't know if that's true or not, but they were evacuated eventually. Uh, but it's just... Uh, the, the story of the heroism of the 54th Massachusetts makes national headlines and it helps spur on mass recruitment of black soldiers. And by the end of the war, nearly 200,000 black men are going to enlist and they're going to make up about 10 percent of the federal army. And Lincoln will uh, give these men credit for helping turn the tide of the war with their enlistment. Uh, and they're going to fight at places like Nashville and at Petersburg and fight with great bravery. Uh, and, and it probably would not have been possible if not for Colonel Shaw, for the men of the 54th Massachusetts, which is now again an active unit in the Army. Uh, it's a ceremonial unit, I think, in the Massachusetts National Guard. They do funerals and honorary things and stuff like that, but they trace their lineage back to a unit that we all as Americans can be proud of, the 54th Massachusetts. I'll put the link up if you want to hear more of Shaw's story that I told at the Antietam battlefield. Thanks for watching.